From nameless men devoured in an alien void to very real sex coinciding with the brutal death of a child, these are the nude scenes that make even the most desensitized of us cringe. Strange, innocence-shattering combinations of fascination and terror have turned up in many of David Lynch's psychosexual films over the years, but Blue Velvet arguably stands out as the most iconic example. The 1986 film, with its tale of idealized American purity battling it out with sexual compulsion and violence, effectively served as a microcosm of both Lynch's unique vision and the larger cultural turmoil of Reagan's America. What kind of beer do you like? Heineken? Heineken? F*** Paps Blue Ribbon! In one particular scene near the film's end, both those themes reach their apex via a shocking use of nudity. Up until this point, Jeffrey Beaumont has been able to keep his sexual trysts with Dorothy Valens and his run-ins with the Lumberton criminal underworld a secret. Suddenly, a fully nude Dorothy turns up at his cozy suburban home, dazed, beaten, and bloodied, bringing the plot of Jeffrey and Sandy Williams vs. Sandy's jealous ex to a screeching halt as everyone scrambles to deal with the bruised stranger. Just like that, the world seems bigger, scarier, and racier than every character but Jeffrey believed it to be. His shadow life intrudes on his normal life with the brute force of a dream taking over reality, or vice versa. Emerald Fennell's Saltburn may not exactly be a New French Extremity-level freakout, but it's certainly one of the most outrageous and sexually adventurous mainstream films to come out in recent years. Even so, one scene easily takes the cake as its most shocking. Fennell, who knows we won't be expecting what's coming, takes her sweet time building towards the money shot. At first, it seems like Oliver will merely engage in a very open and full-bodied display of grief, crying hysterically and hugging the earth as though some delayed form of remorse has finally hit him. Then he gets back on his knees and takes his shirt off. Huh. Weird. And then it happens. Oliver unzips and shoves his member into the grave. Yeah, he really does that. It's clear from the film's first minutes that there's something off about Oliver, but nothing in the film prepares you for grave desecration. And Fennell smartly times her subtlest yet most unexpected use of nudity to coincide with that sudden swerve into darker territory. The result is a scene both shocking in the moment and very difficult to parse. Is Oliver a necrophile? Did he actually love Felix? Is he engaging in another display of power? Is he just really horny and messed up? Is it possible that we'll ever understand? Not really. Li Cheng Dong's burning is a, uh, slow burn that eventually erupts into a literal inferno by the time its final minutes come to pass. Following months of uncertainty, Zhang Su has finally convinced himself that Ben has indeed killed Hei Mi. Armed with that self-permission, he summons Ben to a countryside meetup, stabs him, sets the scene on fire, and leaves. Naturally, in a scene with murder and arson, nudity is small potatoes, but it's the little details that separate a great filmmaker like Lee from the rest. If the ending of Burning is a release of pent-up tension so sudden and anticlimactic that it only begets more queasiness, Jong Su's haphazard behavior is what sells it. And in that sense, seeing Jong Su desperately rid himself of every piece of clothing, toss it all into the car, and stumble away in the freezing cold is the stinger that makes the ending so haunting. It feels like watching Jung Soo be reduced in real time to a trembling wild animal, driven only by survival instinct, almost as though he takes refuge in beastliness to fully rid himself of the human emotions that would otherwise make him feel guilty and afraid. There's nothing sensational or sexual about it. It's just a blunt cap on an explosion of raw violence. Nothing ends, nothing is resolved, there is nothing left but the body. Under the Skin is a disturbing movie from top to bottom, but every scene in which the female lures men into the fluid-draining alien trap packs a special wallop. Each of those sequences is a mini-masterpiece in horror, with various disparate elements brought into a harmonious crescendo of dread. The chamber in itself is creepy, as all get out. The slow descent into the dark fluid is both bizarre and nauseating in its slow certainty. The fact that the victims enter it of their own volition, slipping into a fugue state of horniness without even noticing it, makes things all the more spine-tingling. But the full unceremonious nudity is what cinches it. We're watching prey willingly lodge itself in the predator's mouth, completely docile and unaware of the fate that awaits them. On that note, the one iteration that's really impossible to shake off is the second, in which we see the inside of the trap. The entire world has fallen away for these two poor men. Now, all that's left for them to experience in their final moments is this state of vulnerable suspension in a featureless void that engulfs every inch of their skin as if dragging them back into a fetal, pre-worldly state. 
they desperately reach out to touch hands, longing for some measure of connection before it's all over. Guy number one is devoured first, while guy number two watches helplessly, knowing he'll be next. Rarely has the human body looked so fragile on screen. Over the course of his career, David Cronenberg has developed a sharp, intuitive understanding of the human body's geography and pressure points. Although the bulk of those years of study happened in the body horror genre, his expertise came to serve him handsomely in the 2007 crime drama Eastern Promises, specifically in the staging of the film's infamous bathhouse sequence. In it, a naked and unsuspecting Nikolai gets ambushed by two fully clothed Chechen assassins. At first, as the film builds patiently toward the moment of the fight, Nikolai keeps the towel on, and it almost seems like there might not end up being any explicit nudity. Then Cronenberg springs it on the viewer all at once. What follows is one of cinema's most brutally unglamorous physical tussles ever. Three men desperately claw at each other in a single-minded effort to simply come out alive. The camera never lingers on Nikolai's genitals, they're merely there, as yoked to his body as his legs or his bloody back. For Cronenberg, in a moment like that, there's no point in making any secret of this or that body part. At the end of the day, it's all just tissue from which pain can be extracted. Even working wholly outside the horror genre, he does for saunas what Psycho did for showers. Lars von Trier's Antichrist has about as many passionate fans as it has disparagers, but no one can dispute that it's a deeply personal, deeply emotional film. Conceived in the throes of von Trier's struggles with depression, it's a film that allows itself to truly sit and grapple with despair, staring it down in all its bottomlessness. Chaos reigns. Even its much-noted use of unsimulated sex ultimately serves to express something horrifying that von Trier sees and feels in the world. That something is most fully on display in the film's opening sequence. As the film's two unnamed protagonists have hungry, entranced, liberated sex, their toddler son Nick climbs toward a bedroom window, opens it, and falls to his death. The close-up shots of penetration, accomplished with the help of body doubles for Charlotte Gainsbourg and Willem Dafoe, are startling enough. Von Trier lets us access the full physical breadth of the sex in a way that even cinema's most intense displays of eroticism don't usually allow. But seeing them intercut with a child's death is what makes them stomach-churning. In the film's view of the world, no pleasure can be truly total and cathartic. All of it is willful ignorance, obscene in its ineffectual denial of our mortality, our capacity for evil, our existence in an overwhelmingly sad and brutal world. The grandiose writhing of Defoe and Gainsbourg's figures is only a reminder of how all that sweating will never be enough. It may be a running theme in the history of the slasher genre, but few films have cut to the core of teen sexual anxiety like It Follows. With its sexually transmitted immortal stalker creature premise, the David Robert Mitchell indie horror hit literalized an entire generation's persistent panic over intimacy, trust, desire, bodily autonomy, and the innumerable ways those things can spiral out of control. You can get rid of it, okay? Just sleep with someone as soon as you can. Just pass it along. Not all the creature's forms are direct manifestations of that panic. In some cases, like the tall man in the bedroom and the elderly woman in the school hallways, the creepiness comes down to ace casting and framing. But the woman in the kitchen just might be the single most unsettling version of it. And it's largely due to the way her presence brings the film's sexual themes to the forefront. Face bruised, teeth missing, clothes bizarrely torn, arms held in an uncomfortable stance behind her back, she suggests a victim of sexual abuse, an avatar of Jay's unspoken and unprocessed fears surrounding her adult sex life. Urine streams down her leg, further violating the kitchen's sexually hermetic quarters. Her single sock soaks it up in the film's most tactile moment of agony. For a few seconds before running away, Jay is paralyzed, and it's understandable. The image before her is revolting and disorienting enough just to watch through the comfort of a screen. In Mary Heron's American Psycho, there's a sense of powerlessness in seeing a man as dull, pathetic, and annoying as Patrick Bateman turn the world into his gory playground. Hey, Paul! Throughout the film, Bateman keeps staking his claim on a fantasy of power and freedom, which ultimately serves no purpose beyond its own assertion. His whole life is based on doing what he wants just to feel that he can do it. His taste for undress as a confirmation of that fantasy reaches its logical conclusion in the film's scariest scene, which sees him maniacally chase Christy with a chainsaw while fully nude. Despite her best efforts to escape, he succeeds in killing her, dropping the chainsaw on her from many floors up. 
This is Bateman at his most deranged, and he still wins. It's ridiculous that he thinks highly of himself for killing, yes, and it's even more ridiculous that he thinks it's cooler to do it naked. But he gets what he wants. The film's fundamental tragedy, that the United States permits a man like this, a philosophy like this, to be rewarded, finds its clearest embodiment in Bale's chiseled body, a perfect instrument for nothing but senseless violence and arbitrary indulgence.